Hey there everybody, it's Mike Delicio with another Solo Mode review. Today I'm going to be taking a look at the Solo Mode for Dwellings of Eldervale from designer Luke Laurie and publisher Breaking Games. Dwellings of Eldervale is a fantasy-themed worker placement game where in the solo game you're playing against an AI opponent known as the Ghosts of Eldervale. Let's head on over to the table, I'll give you a general overview of the solo components, and then we'll come back here and I'll give you my final thoughts. Okay, so for the purposes of the solo review of Dwellings of Eldervale, I'm not going to do a general game overview. If you'd like to see how the game is played, you can take a look at our Four Corners review. There was an overview done of that. I'll post a link to that video in the description of this one. What I'm going to do is just show you the components that come in the uh, box for the solo game, and they're all really represented right here. You have a mat for your AI opponent, which is the Ghosts of Eldervale, and they say that they recommend you use either a white or the black factions, just a nice thematic thing. So in the, for the purposes of this demonstration, I'm using the white uh, faction for the ghosts. This is a watcher meeple, and I'll explain in a moment how that works. This comes with the game, and you've got a deck of ghost cards, all right? And so generally speaking, when you're playing a solo game of Dwellings of Eldervale, it's set up as a two-player game you are going to play against this faction, the Ghosts of Eldervale. And so, generally, everything is set up as per normal for a two-player game. Your turns, as the player, are going to work exactly the same as they do in the multiplayer game. You can battle the Ghosts as if they were a regular faction. The monsters are going to battle the Ghosts as if they were a regular faction. For all intents and purposes, they are a faction out there on the map with you. All right? And so the way that the ghost turn works is that every time you take a action to place a unit onto the map, you're going to place this watcher in the same space. And it's going to be really used as a reference point for the ghost cards. And so you've got a stack of ghost cards here, and there's going to be one out for each of these three kind of uh, regions, I guess, that are associated with the sides of a D6. One, two, and three, four, five, and six. And so on the ghost turn, these are called action zones. On the ghost turn, you're gonna roll a D6 to determine which card is going to trigger, all right? And so in this case, if I rolled a six, you're gonna take the leftmost unit and you're gonna place it where it tells you to on the card. So in this case, it's telling you that in reference to the watcher, you're gonna place it to the upper right of that. Now. What if there is no such realm? What if this is like on the edge of the map, perhaps? Well, in that case, then what you're going to do is place the unit in the region where the watcher is, which will very likely trigger some type of a combat because that is the place where you last went. And then once you've placed it, so every turn, you're going to place a unit where it tells you. So in this case, this is telling you to place one to the bottom left. In this case, you're supposed to be placing it just to the right. You always do that first. You place out a unit where it tells you to, and then if there's something else it tells you to do, you do that. In this case, it's telling you to place a new realm. And so you would take a new realm tile and you would place that out on the map. This would get discarded and then a new card would come out. So there are a number of things that these cards can tell you to do. For example, in this case, it's telling you to construct a dwelling. And so the first thing you do is you place out a worker. Theoretically, you'd place it there, but if you couldn't, you'd place it in the same spot. That would mean that you are actually going to be, the, the right away, you're going to be making a dwelling of that unit you put out. But um, if you could put it there, you would put a unit there, and then you would construct a dwelling, if you can, on the spot of the, uh, of the watcher. If not, you go in this kind of clockwise order, and you try to build one in any place that you can. And so there are a number of different cards here. Most of them are going to be variations on a theme. So this one, you're not doing anything besides placing, constructing dwellings. Here you get a new adventure card. Now, the AI, the Ghosts of Eldervale, don't get resources like a regular player does. The only thing that the Ghosts get are magic cards, which basically 
every resource is converted to magic cards. They do also get adventure cards. They start with one. And how you determine that is you also roll a die and you compare it to the tokens that are here. So in this case, if they were to get a new adventure card, I roll a dice, I get a four there. That corresponds to the black uh, cards. I would get one of those adventure cards and just place it in their area. At the beginning of the game, they actually start with one. I would have done this during setup. Two, they would have started with the doorway, the white doorway card. And so they just keep stacks of those adventure cards throughout the game. The other thing that could happen is you have the reshuffle here where you place it in the discard and then reshuffle them back. You gain magic cards, which are resources. And again, they can also be placed onto actual ruin tiles. So in this case, is this case, you don't know, it might be a ruin tile, it might be a uh, element tile, but in this case specifically, it's telling you place onto the fortress, place onto the mage tower, okay? Um, making sure there's nothing here we haven't seen. A special dwelling. Choose any elemental realm that is occupied by a ghostly worker but doesn't already contain a dwelling. Construct a ghostly dwelling using that worker. Uh, choose one destroyed monster, return it to its lair. Any units or other monsters in the lair are sent to the underworld. Okay, so you can see there are different things that this, uh, that this deck will allow the ghosts to do. The other thing to keep in mind is that any of the ghost units that get sent to the underworld are going to add a die, a battle die, so they get stronger the more of them that go to the underworld. And that's similar to when your units get sent, you get a sword. So, the ghosts are going to continue to take their actions until they have to regroup. And there's a couple of ways they could regroup. Uh, well, actually, they're going to generally, uh, whenever they have to draw from an area and they have no workers there, they're going to regroup, all right? And regrouping is going to be uh, a couple of things. A couple of things are going to happen when they regroup. They're going to score points. They're going to score two victory points for every ghost unit that's in a ruin. They're going to score one victory point for every ghost unit that they have in the underworld. All right. And then you're also going to arrange the workers so that they come back in a particular order. So if a number of these workers had gone out, you can see they have numbers here. One, two, three, four, five, and six. The special workers are always going to go where they belong. And it also is going to tell you how many dice they roll in combat as well. All right. So... Generally speaking, that's how the game's going to go. Two-player game, you're taking your turns. The ghosts are taking their turns. They're going to be competing for things just as well, building those dwellings. Endgame triggers are uh, the same as they would be normally, running out of the deck uh, or building your sixth dwelling. Endgame scoring, you're going to score exactly as you normally would as a player in the game. The ghosts are going to score based on their elemental power because they're going to be moving up those elemental tracks just like you would normally. They're going to score dwellings just like a living player. And the ghosts are going to score all of their adventure cards. Unlike a living player where you, uh, it depends on the number of dwellings you have, which is the, how many cards you can score. The AI is always going to be able to score all of their adventure cards, and then they're going to score one victory point for every magic card in their hand of any kind. You're going to compare your score to the ghosts, and whoever has the highest score wins Dwellings of Eldervale. Let's head back over, and I'll give you my final thoughts. Okay, so hopefully that gave you a pretty good idea on how the solo game for Dwellings of Eldervale plays out. As I said in that little overview, it wasn't going to be a complete rules uh overview because we have the four squares review. So if you do want to get a better idea on how the game plays, feel free to take a look at that. And I go into a lot more detail on the actual mechanics of the game, how the kind of map is made and things along those lines. For this, I really just want to focus on the solo components and how they change the rules of the game. So the first thing I want to do is talk about some solo benchmarks. These are things I like to look at when I determine the pros and cons of a solo game and whether I want to get it out down off the shelf and, and play. The first thing I like to talk about is a win-loss condition. Is it a beat your high score variant or are you playing against an AI opponent? In Dwellings of Elder Vale, you are playing against a automated opponent known as the Ghosts of Elder Vale. And for a game like this, which involves you know some, some map uh, control and some resource management and things along those lines, I think this is really the best way to handle a solo variant. I think it would have been unsatisfying, and quite honestly, I'm not really sure how you would have pulled this off as a high score variant. So uh, I'm very, very happy with 
having an actual opponent to play against. There are a lot of interaction points, and I think it would have felt very unsatisfying to not have an actual opponent to be battling over. The multiplayer game of Dwellings of Elder Vale is pretty highly interactive, and so the solo game is replicating that, and so you have to have that opponent to have that interaction with. Set up and tear down. Now, this is a large game. Uh, no matter which version of it you get, whether it's the retail version or the deluxe version or the legendary version, there are going to be a lot of components and therefore there's some setup and teardown. However, I've got to say that the game trays inserts are done so well in this game that they absolutely, to me, make the setup and teardown a breeze. For a game like this that has this many components and this much involved, I don't know that I can think of a game that sets up and tears down more quickly. And really a big part of that is the functionality of those inserts. Now, I have seen some beautiful game inserts out there that, that look wonderful, but they maybe don't have the functionality or the usability that they do in Dwellings of Eldervale. I am really, really happy with how quickly I can get this game set up, played, and torn down. Uh, really, again, for a game that gives this type of experience, I don't know that I can think of a quicker setup and teardown for the amount of components and the amount of experience. So really a, a big positive there. The other thing I like to talk about are rules. And in Dwellings of Elder Vale, they do something that I absolutely adore, which is that the solo game gets its own dedicated rule book. Now, I know for a number of different reasons this can't always be possible but there's a whole lot to be said for when it can. Number one, it makes me feel like there was a very distinct effort in making the solo game something that stood apart, that was integrated into the game's design, but also is not something that if you are sifting through the rule book, you have to go back and forth. Like, okay, well, uh, what, where's the exception for this? Usually it's fine to have the solo rules at the end of a rule book, but in the case of Dwellings, where you have your own dedicated rule book, I think that that is fantastic. Not only is it nice that it's a separate rule book, it's a really well done rule book. I have zero complaints with the way it's written, the way it's laid out. I think they did a fantastic job. It keeps the exact same uh, continuity with the style of the other rule book. So uh, it really feels well integrated, even though it's its own separate book. No complaints there, I learned the game uh, from the rule book, I don't feel like I had any real questions, no ambiguities. I wasn't running onto Board Game Geek trying to figure out how something worked. Really good job with the rule book. Art and components. Well, I happen to think that the art in Dwellings of Elderdale is fantastic. I know that many times people will, will throw out that term generic fantasy, and I suppose there's some element of truth to this idea, this notion of a generic fantasy, but I don't think Dwellings of Eldervale fits that. I like the, uh, the different distinct uh, factions that you can play, and although they don't necessarily play all that different from each other, it's enough theme for me. It's enough of a kind of a feeling of doing something a little bit different, whether you're playing as the pirates or the dwarves or whatever the case may be. I think that the art does a great job of kind of helping immerse you into those different uh, factions that you might be playing against. I like that the ghosts can be played really with any faction, and it still fits. Uh, the art is wonderful. The components are through the roof. Now, I will say for the, for the record that the copy of the game that I own, that I backed on Kickstarter, is the Legendary Edition, which is the top tier of the game. And so, that being said, I've got the, the beautiful pre-washed miniatures, and I've got the wooden uh, tiles for the elemental tokens. And so it's all gorgeous. However, I have seen the retail version of the game and it's still fantastic. It still has those amazing inserts from game trades that really helps to set up and tear down the game. And so no matter what edition of the game you get, you're going to have remarkably high quality components, good cards, nice dice, beautiful insert. The tiles are thick. The, the, all of the cardboard components, components are well done, and you would have standees if you have the, the regular uh, retail edition, and those are just fine. You, it doesn't detract from the game. Now, you know, if you're like me and you, you are an aesthetic gamer, I'll put it to you that way, 
I love having the miniatures and I even like having the sound effects bases that come in the legendary edition. Completely unnecessary, but I'll always choose to play with them. That's just me personally. So you're going to have great components no matter what edition of the game you have. Nothing but good things to say about the art and components. All right, so my overall solo experience. If you have watched any of the videos I've done on the Dice Tower here recently, my thoughts for this game, Dwellings of Elder Vale, are well established. It is my number one game of 2020. It's also my number one solo game of 2020. I think it does so many things so well. Sometimes you feel like games are just right in your wheelhouse and Dwellings of Elder Vale is that. I have played it many times. I have taught it multiple times. I have played it solo many times. I really think it provides a fantastic solo experience. It, it has a great combination of having those interaction points handled well without a huge amount of administration on the part of the player. And that is a really difficult thing to pull off. When it's done well, it just shines. And I think this is an example where it's done well, where there are a couple of times where you might as a player have to make a choice, but it's always gonna be something that is easily determined and there's a way to handle it. Usually through rolling a D6, whether you're choosing which, which, uh, uh, which one of the cards to get or the, the region for the dwelling, it's all very well handled. There's no edge cases or things along those lines that you have to worry about. Just a stellar, stellar experience. I really feel like it feels the same. And that's such a huge thing. In a game like this, where you've got so much interactivity and you are kind of fighting against a rival opponent, to be able to feel like you're essentially playing the same game with very few adjustments is really paramount. And I think Dwellings does a great job of it. Sure, you make some concessions. The, the, the AI doesn't collect resources in the same way. They only collect magic cards. But that doesn't change the core experience of the game. I love the fact that when the ghosts go out on the map, the monsters could rush against them and fight them. You don't handle them any differently. You can fight with them. They're going to rush into a battle. The monsters are going to rush into a battle. You can still have those great interactive points of the game that are some of my favorite parts of this game and still do it in a solo experience. The cards that you play still work. You know, you can still pull off these great moves with your magic cards against the ghost players. You don't have to make concessions in this game. And I guess that's really what it comes down to is that I don't feel like I have to make any concessions when I'm playing the solo game of Dwellings of Elder Vale. And since I like it so much as a multiplayer game, I feel like I'm essentially getting the same game here with the solo game. Why wouldn't I like it? That being said, I don't know if there's really a lot of drama here with as much as I've been gushing about it. I give Dwellings of Elder Vale a 10 out of 10 a seal of excellence, my solo game of 2020. I have a sneaking suspicion it's going to eventually and maybe relatively soon work its way into the higher ranks of my all-time games and solo games. So there you have it, Dwellings of Elder Vale, just a fantastic game, a, fan a fantastic solo game. Thank you so much for your time as always, and have a great day.